Hi. Uh, thanks to the organizers to uh, organize this ni nice workshop, uh, and thanks for hanging around for, for this talk. Uh, typically, we're in North America, so planets don't migrate. Um, so uh, let's get a work on, on how this uh, happens in our modern models of protoplanetary disks. And this is uh, actually fit, uh, going to be more or less an overview of planet migration. Uh, to round out the workshop was a little bit awkward, but sure. So um, where we start from is a model of the structure of a protoplanetary disk. I've seen this a few times before. The driving thing behind what's what's happening uh, in the field these days is understanding the uh, the non-ideal MHD effects and the fact that the disk has a very hard time being being turbulent through it and viscously driven through the whole thing. It probably gets driven by a magnetothermal wind, which mainly drives an accretion flow across the top layer, leaving the uh, midplane in in the uh, in the few AU region where we want to do a lot of our plant formation relatively unmolested by uh, by uh, viscous effects like the turbulence, so you can run numerical models of that, and here's an example of that from uh, collaborators and myself. Of this, you see here the the velocity field forming this wind, this relatively laminar uh, midplane region, and these quite smooth uh, magnetic fields where even in the upper regions, the uh, ambipolar diffusion is quenching out uh, the flow and keeping it nice and smooth. So what happens when you drop a planet into a disk? As a bit of review for anybody who maybe hasn't uh, run into this before. Oh, or, yeah, set this up. I uh, dropped a planet in here to a disk. It's migrating in. It's ca causing a, a response to the gas surface density. And that is, uh, in return, is causing a torque on the planet. And we can think of that as being made up of contributions from these two spiral, spiral wakes, one, the inner one pulling forwards and the other one pulling back. And it's cancellation between those two, which will set the torque on the planet. There's also material in the co-rotation region, co-orbital region here, which makes these horseshoe turns encountering the planet. Um, and the asymmetry between the angular momentum exchange on these two will, again, uh, lead to a contribution to the torque. So these things naturally uh, depend on the parameters of the planet and the disk. So what we can do um, is, is look at the uh, behavior you get as a function of uh, two of the most, uh, there's many parameters, but two of the ones that are, are most interesting here are the planet mass as the planets grow and the disk turbulent viscosity, um, where on here at the high viscosity end of parameter space, we have turbulent, we have viscous protoplanetary disks, and here in the low viscosity end of parameter space, we have wind-driven disks, and particularly the near midplane regions of those uh, protoplanetary disks. Then, each uh, colored block here is a previously uh, identified, um, to some to, to various degrees, uh, regime of reasonably well behind, behave, uh, defined behavior for planets migrating in disks. And then each of these gray streets is because where there's some sort of uh, critical parameter change that leads to a change in this behavior. So if you, there's many citations for each of these. So this is the introduction section of that paper right there, which is a good place to go look these up if these are, any of these are unfamiliar to you. So now that we know, um, compared to a lot of the previous work that's been um, done in plant formation that we're probably not in a terribly viscous disk, we're in something wind-driven, and we can gray out this side of the diagram and focus on what's happening over here. But there's actually a lot of complicated and nonlinear behavior that comes up because we're in this low viscosity flow. So what I'm going to do now, and in the remaining time, is try and work through examples of all these things and the differences back and forth here. So let's start at the bottom. Um, it, with a uh, dynamical co-rotation torque in the low viscosity regime and a standard saturated, um, viscously unsaturated type 1 uh, migration in the high viscosity regime. So I'm going to show you a, a, a little numerical experiment here where I do uh, two runs in the same disk and uh, in the same planet and then they run for a bit and then I do uh, make one, a modification to each of those disks that's different uh, for those two. Here, this, is a vi this disk becomes viscous, and there's accretion driven through it by that um, viscosity. And here, the disk is um, driven by a uh, laminar magnetic braking torque that drives the flow in. So we'll start up here. We got our planets migrating in in a viscous disk. These views here are the vortensity of the disk. You can see the co-orbital region there forming up. And down here, as that flash just happened, 
what happened was I turned on these uh, either viscous effect or the, the magnetic uh, breaking torque. Here in this viscous disk, you see that the, the flow, the corrotation torque has been unsaturated, and we've, we're maintaining the background gradient of vortensity across there. So that leads to the asymmetry between the angular momentum exchange on those two uh, horseshoe turns, and that planet just has a nice, steady, constant torque and just drives in. Something very strange is happening over here, however. You see that this planet, at the rate of uh, that the, uh, the disk is being driven in by this magnetic braking torque, the planet alone can't keep up by, uh, with the disk flow from its Lindblad torques, so it gets kind of stuck behind, and the vortensity in the Libration Island actually reverses and runs away. Um, so this, as this comes around here, you'll see that this uh, saved up vortensity actually gets depleted and reversed to the other, other sign as the planet fails to keep up with the flow. And that leads to this very large positive corrotation torque turning the planet around and driving it out through the disk instead of in. So there's a big difference across this division here, also depending on what's happening in the rest of the disk. So let's move on. Um, going up a little bit in uh, planet mass, we can get above the feedback mass, um, which is uh, the uh, parameter that comes up in the Goodman and Rafikov and Rafikov work um, uh, for the planet starting to modify the disk surface density by its spiral wake. So in a viscous disk, the planet migrates in more or less in a type one manner and quite rapidly. The, the individual time series in these two uh, animations are the same, so each frame is the same physical time. In this inviscid disk, however, that planet's moving a lot slower, and the structures it's driving are going unstable and causing all Rossby wave instability, kicking off vortices. And so we're getting a quite different behavior there. So I want to dig into this a little bit more. Actually, we'll start with a little bit of viscosity um, where we can get a smooth effect. And this lets us discuss the uh, feedback uh, slowing of, of migration where these spiral shocks here are changing the vortensity of the disk, piling up uh, mass, and that changes the balance between these two uh, Lindblad torques. So this is a pretty old prediction, coming up as the uh, inertial limit concept from Ward Hurigan, and then refined by Rafikov 2002. If I run that simulation here, here, you'll see that again, this is the one I used earlier. That planet is able to uh, get to a nice kind of uh, steady, um, but much slowed from the type one rate migration due to the near cancellation of those migration torques. That can be arranged to happen with a little bit of viscosity to keep these nice and smooth. If you uh, regard this because there's a bit of gap of type two, then you, well, the, the, there's a bit of a question here about whether you want to call this maybe part of type two migration or not. And then there's an interesting thing of the data from here, which you can find in said paper, um, doesn't quite agree with things like the Kanagawa concept for uh, type two migration. But um, I guess the last thing I should say there is that numerically this converges in it very well because I've got that viscosity to smooth out small scales of the flow. Now, the, uh, the correct feed, um, inertial limit prediction uh, that you get from 1D models would be that the planet should actually kind of properly stop um, in an inviscid disk. So here's the, ver the inviscid version of that. And this is a resolution study. Here is slightly more than anybody's r run before in terms of uh, resolution on that problem. Here's a little bit more than two times, and here's a little bit more than five times the resolution anybody's run before. That's up to 93 cells per scale height. And you see that at the lowest resolution I have, the planet actually does slow down from the type one rate and eventually uh, nearly stop, but then vortices that arise uh, in the edge of the gap and those pressure bumps start to free the planet up again and it drives in faster. That behavior kind of, um, it actually then gets into kind of a type three jump. That behavior continues at higher resolution and at the highest resolution here, we get this behavior where the, shown the vortensity, these vortices that both come off of the outer edge of the gap and on the edge of the libration region lead to this very jumpy migration and rearrangement of the disk, which instead of stopping the planet leads to this slow interaction with vortices driving it in a wobbly manner. So the, this brings up the issue of whether this is converged, which 
I don't think you can actually say it's converged. But also at the same time, I'm up to 96 free scales for scale height in a two-dimensional model of the disk. So for this problem, this is probably the highest resolution two-dimensional simulation that anybody should ever run. We're, we've hit a limit here on how we can consider this behavior. But it's clear that the inertial limit um, that you predict from the one-dimensional models, as you go to two dimensions, at least that seems to fall apart, and the planets don't stop. Now, um, quickly I'll show you a uh, scan across viscosity from, low, from high viscosity to low to show this um, change in behaviors. So at the highest viscosity, I can get something that agrees quite well with the type 1 migration rate. As I go down to a uh, little bit lower in viscosity, we actually get this is a, a heavy enough planet that it drops into a type 3 migration um, immediately. As I go to a lower viscosity, it's able to modify the, uh, the shocks are able to modify the disk quickly enough to end up in that smooth feedback I showed you. And then at lower viscosity, the vortices which form, you can see here, are freeing it up compared to the smooth feedback rate. And it actually ends up um, jumping into its, uh, the, pre the density bump it's pushed in front of it inwards in a type 3 uh, uh, behavior. Although these types of behavior in 2D are quite resolution dependent. So um, now just to finish up here around the uh, last corner here, a little quick bit of type 2 with vortices. You go to very high mass planets, what we see then is once we have uh, gaps that are depleted by several orders of magnitude from the background, that planets move initially until they sit in their deep gap and then are freed up when there is um, matter the released by the gap edge instabilities that can then interact with the planet. So this, this is part of the story with what's happening in type two at low viscosity. Now, what we've been recently uh, doing, and I, I promised Phil I, I, I'd show a bit of when I came, um, was, is to go um, into three dimensions on some of these things. This is clearly, clearly needed. So we've got a, a, a grant out of price, uh, the European tier zero uh, allocation system. Um, and we've been running uh, Fargo at quite high resolution with quite big grids on this. And here's some of the, some of the results. So this is a comparison between, again, a two-dimensional vertically integrated model of an adiabatic section of the disk um, with a, a planet uh, just above the feedback mass. And this is the libration region. And you can see the classical uh, Korakansky and Balmforth type behavior with these uh, vortices at the edge of the libration island. And then you'll see as the planet moves in, we get a situation like one expects for classical dynamical core rotation torques, where the vortensity of the libration island looks like the color of where the planet started. However, in three dimensions, something totally different is happening. We're getting an enhancement of vortensity, not a preservation. So it's clear that something very important is happening here with the difference between two and three dimensions, beyond also just how these vortices interact and decay or don't, because three and two-dimensional vortices behave very differently. There's a little bit of a clue of what that is I can show you here. If I keep the planet fixed, these two movies, again, this just well mixes by background vortensity. Here, it's not the movement of the planet that's leading it, it's inherently the three-dimensionality of the flow that's leading to uh, uh, this vortensity or vertically integrated uh, vortensity-like quantity uh, enhancement. And the net effect of this is once you have the planets moving, that introduces an asymmetry to the shape of this libration island. This has a negative co-rotation torque contribution, whereas in this situation, the usual dynamical co-rotation torques give you a positive uh, co-rotation torque uh, contribution. Now, the last thing I want to want to get on to is a little bit um, related to what Daniel just showed you, where he was using long chains of planets with a lot of mass in them uh, that would eventually uh, uh, push in and, and then sometimes undergo dynamical instability um, to uh, result in uh, chains of planets which are not, in the end, in mean motion resonances, as we find that most of the things in the Kepler sam sampler aren't. So, here's a contrast between considering migration in a viscous disk, as he just did, and a disk which is inviscid. So the experiment, this is actually just a um, 
this isn't nearly as, uh, as ambitious a, a, an attempt at a prediction. This is an attempt at an apples-to-apples -apples numerical comparison between these two scenarios for a disk. What I've rigged here is a disk which in both cases has a turbulent and um, uh, d decreasing in dens density inner edge, so the planets pile up against, and then an outer region, which is here, viscous all the way through, and hence uh, a model for turbulence, and here, um, inviscid in the outer region. You'll see these uh, red orbit circles that are piling in as the plants come in, in both cases. In the viscous case, plants compress into a nice chain of mean motion resonances, whereas in the inviscid case, you see that the vortices, these C-shaped uh, bright things that pop up as the plants are able to feed back into the disk, uh, add extra perturbations to the system and allow these plants to undergo close encounters um, and reorganize. I can show you that a little bit more clearly if I show you the semi-major axes of the planets versus time. And here, the, uh, uh, in the viscous case, they compress into this nice smooth resonant chain. In the inviscid case, the uh, extra perturbations allow the planets to have close encounters, um, and uh, it sequentially compresses into this much tighter configuration, but sometimes with planets out of resonance. Then, that's only part of the problem, though. We do have to worry about what happens when the disk goes away. <clears throat> so, if we do this, we add a phase in the simulation where we uh, dissipate the disk on some time scale, and then transfer into a pure n-body evolution. We see that in the viscous case, the, plan the, chain, the uh, chain of planets in the mean motion resonances stays stable for a long time. Here, I've only orbited integrated them out to uh, 100, million year, uh, 100 million years. Um, uh, and it, in, yeah, they're stable in the viscous case, mostly stable in the viscous case, whereas in the viscid case, again, here only with five planets as opposed to a very long chain, um, they tend to go unstable, and then also sometimes you uh, seem to get lucky and find a, find a configuration which doesn't appear to be in, um, in such mean motion resonances, but does seem to have long-lived stability. So it looks like there's an important difference between what, what one might predict for uh, the, the formation of, of, of uh, systems of planets in an inviscid disk versus a viscous disk, once you have uh, these super-Earth mass planets. So... That's actually, I managed to get through that in, in, in good time. So yeah, we, we now understand the planets form in these inviscid, wind-driven wind -driven disks. Once we understand that, we know we have to be working with planet-disk interaction theory over on this side of the diagram, and we get very different predictions um, than what one might have expected uh, for the traditional viscous disk things. And that actually poses a very significant computational challenge because two dimensions often isn't enough, um, the, uh, we need inherently often for to do things like the last thing I showed you, probably very long integration times um, in multi-dimensions. And there's uh, then also the issues of actually dealing with the wind and um, such issues, particularly up here. So, I'm going there. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, perfect time. Even uh, even early. Um, questions? Yes. We have these eccentricities and in inclinations in these low viscosity cases. I mean, of course, you know, it's an old prediction that if the gap is very clear, uh, there should be some excitation, or there might be some excitation of eccentricity. Uh, um, so you're you're asking particularly um, up here? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, okay, so with a, w this, we haven't gotten into doing so much work on yet. So that's an interesting question. Um, there is uh, a little bit of eccentricity that comes out due to the vortices um, that I've seen here, but for the most part, this hasn't been something we've uh, actually gone into too much yet. Um, so this is one of the many things that does get interesting again once we're at low viscosity. Of course, it's potentially yeah. constrainable, especially the inclination. Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure how interest how useful this question is, but just doesn't hurt. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
is there any reason we, we, sh we should think that a turbulent alpha viscosity will behave similar to a viscosity for this type of problem? Because you're talking about a boundary layer in some way between these regions, right? I mean, is there a reason Okay, we so I think, think you're, you're asking, um, if, if I could paraphrase that and the way I like to say it, um, is that is, is alpha a good uh, uh, model for, alpha viscosity a good model for the diffu actual diffusive effect of turbulence on this problem? Yeah, because you're particularly caring about this, this one region, really. I mean, yeah, I can see it isn't in, in many cases, but for this particular case. Yeah, because there's, there's very localized uh, re exactly. regions of the flow yeah. that we really care about that have particular contrast going right. in them. You're seeing this big change basically yeah. because of a change in this localized region. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I think the answer is no, and that hasn't been taken seriously enough by the community. Um, uh, yeah, that's actually something that, that, that probably needs some work. Something like uh, lots of high-resolution DNS and then trying to compare that back to uh, Reynolds averaging the flow back again. Um, the, uh, yeah, because a lot of what's kicking off these state vortices is Rossby wave instability. And I don't think alpha is a good predictor for what Rossby, instability, Rossby wave instability tends to build and it's diffu the end diffusive effect if, it, if there really isn't that much of building those big vortices. So it's, it's probably not a great model anyway. Um, so in that sense, I'm putting viscosity in here because that's what we do, but turbulence and viscosity may be different. Um. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. It reminded me of an old <laughs> bee in my bonnet. Um, the, uh, <laughs> another, th there's the, the fact that it's layered accretion might make you suspicious of representing MRIs of viscosity. That's what Jenny yep. was asking about. But also, uh, time dependence. So this ordinary viscosity of gases, because the collision frequency is so high compared to frequencies in the flows, is essentially constant in frequency. Yep. But MRI, or pretty much any turbulence, it definitely has a characteristic time scale which is comparable to omega. Yep. Um, so I if you have disturbances which are at high frequency compared to that, such as vortices are one thing, but even worse, spiral waves, yep. uh, it's not at all clear that they seem, the viscosity that damps spiral waves is the same for a given turbulence as the viscosity which causes axisymmetric gap engines, for example, to spread. Now, I, I wish someone would do a simulation where you force a spiral wave in an MRI turbulent system, measure the damping length, um, yeah, I think actually uh, Richard Nelson, uh, if anybody yeah, has done the closest to that, the, the difficulty with, with that is now we're in probably not in MRI turbulent disks, you know, wind-driven disks. Um, yeah, okay, but I still, yeah. Um, the, yeah, it's, 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 there it's, are it's, other disks, maybe yeah. not protocols. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very MRI relevant to the work Mordecai is doing on, on black hole uh, accretion disk. Uh, okay, well, I sh I'll go yeah. read his paper. Yeah. So no, this is this is it. This is this is direction. Clearly, I think things have to go. Uh, fi finally, at the end, we're getting into this discussion. <laughs> uh, yes, Vlad. Yeah. So, uh, so this map there. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I would call it a migration town. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Migration town. Yeah. Um, well, it's one version, right? There probably should be things sticking out this way with other parameters. Right. right? I was wondering that if the uh, the color coding of the the blocks do they mean anything? Like the growth rates, the the, 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 no. the damping times? No. No. I I, I went right? to I went to a color palette uh, generator website because I have very bad <laughs> color vision, and so I got hex codes and filled them in. My, my wife hates this color scheme, by the way. <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, what viscosity is here? Okay, so um, uh, there's a, th this, there's, we try to basically write a review um, of the references um, uh, for each of these things in this paper. So it's actually, it, it, it's a good thing to look at. This, I, uh, especially down here, is pretty much predicted by uh, Samyon's um, work on uh, the viscous um, unsaturation of co-rotation torques. Uh, so that, of course, sorry? Sorry? No? Yeah, um, that's uh, around alpha 10 to the minus three-ish. Um, but it depends, it does depend, so there's, a, there's some, a 
uh, very purposeful kind of wobbliness to these because it does depend on, on the planet, ma planet mass because it depends on the width of the co-rotation region. But it is, turns out, viscous unsaturation is exactly the thing that gives you the, when, sorry, when you, on the, when you, sa the, when you saturate the co-rotation torque is precisely where dynamical co-rotation torques come in for the, for the precise re same reasons that you're stopping unsaturating them. So it's, it's exactly that change. That's actually one of the best, best defined of these. And that's sense. the same as the viscous putting up there? Um, yeah, this one and this one um, aren't really well defined. So this one's actually in here drawn in at an angle because if you look then at, uh, say, this paper for the same for the same viscosity for two different planet masses, the low mass planet definitely gets a feedback mod mod uh, modified, uh, uh, sorry, vortex is, and, and feedback modified migration, whereas the higher mass planet has the smooth migration. So somebody should go out and work out um, uh, exactly. Uh, some kind of a theory for what the parameter changing on that is. Um, and this one is also just kind of uh, uh, filled in that way because at high viscosity, you don't get a vortex when you go in type 2, and at low viscosity, you do. Yeah, I guess the mm. question was really what is the viscosity be below which you have... Uh, um, so so this, is th this is in the alpha 10 to the minus 4-ish um, region. Uh, uh, although that's only for the higher mass planet that we managed to do a convergence study up on there. Uh. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Okay. If not, I think Phil wants. Do would you like to say something? Yeah. Well, first of all, let's thank um, <laughs> Colin and Daniel. And maybe you want to say something. Yeah, so, so just briefly, um, I guess, first of all, I'd like to, to thank everyone, everyone for coming. Uh, speaking for myself, I had, I had high expectations for the meeting, knowing who was coming, and uh, my expectations have been exceeded, so thank you very much. Um, I'd like to encourage you, uh, there'll be more meetings here at, here at the CCA in, in the future, so, and also, if you're just passing through New York, we, we're, we have a lot of visitors here, and we're delighted to welcome visitors, so if you have new results, come and present them at group meetings, and, and just stop by so so please please do consider that and then finally um ho hope everyone agrees it was uh, well organized by the, the cca staff so um thanks to abigail to the the av people and the, the other people who've been, been helping and maybe, maybe we can just give them a round of applause